Council is one of the more fascinating adventure games that I've played in recent memory. That's not to say that there's a lack of interesting adventure games, there are plenty of them, and though I may not be a die-hard fan, I certainly do have my favorites. What makes the Council stand out among these titles, however, is just how much it changes the tried-and-true adventure game formula for the better. It's a great leap towards expanding the genre into something much more involved, stepping beyond the use of mere item puzzles into something that incorporates a focus on a deeper narrative experience and much more robust gameplay elements. Elements that are presented well enough that makes the Council stand out amongst its peers. And as it turns out, those are among the Council's best qualities. They're the things that give it quite a bit of staying power. The game does a good job of incorporating RPG elements into its gameplay, hell of a lot better than some AAA RPGs that have come out in recent memory. So much so that I'm actually tempted to call it an adventure RPG hybrid, though I think doing so might overstate just how much of an RPG it is, and I wouldn't want to give anybody any false impressions. Nevertheless, the inclusion of a skill system that leads to meaningful character builds in conjunction with a plot that has some substantial decision making, which does affect several scenario outcomes, elevates the game a notch above what I might have initially expected from the outset. And I don't just mean press the button at the end of the game to choose the ending cinematic, or the way that some of Telltale's games hide their supposed reactivity under a layer of smoke and mirrors. The game certainly has its faults, and those faults are glaring, but I don't find that they, for the most part, detracted from the overall positive experience that I had with the Council. I think that if you're a part of the Council's core audience, that is to say, somebody who's a fan of adventure games or somebody with a predilection for social intrigue, then the Council may just very well be a game you ought to look into, because truthfully, I can't think of too many things that are quite like it. Originally released in 2018, the Council was developed by Big Bad Wolf as an episodic adventure game. You play as Louis de Richet, a member of an 18th century secret society who is whisked away to a private island off the shores of England in order to attend a meeting which includes the likes of figures such as Napoleon Bonaparte, George Washington, and Manuel Godoy. And if you're familiar with that last figure without looking him up, congratulations, you're just about as big of a nerd as I am. While it takes a little bit of time to actually build up in the game itself, the premise immediately sets the tone for the Council, indulging in themes of conspiracy and social collusion by offering you a promise that the game's going to let you rub shoulders with these massive, influential figures that control the fate of the world. And frankly, using it as a selling point and plastering it all over the game's marketing was smart, as it was one of the reasons that I picked it up. However, this is largely the game's backdrop. Your real reason for being on the island is to find your missing mother, as well as getting yourself untangled from a murder mystery, all while navigating the politics of a secret society that basically controls the affairs of the world from the shadows. Seriously, this game just has, like, me written all over it. Oh, and there's also this occult book that's a direct reference to H.P. Lovecraft, and it plays a not at all unimportant MacGuffin, which is what enmeshes you in this whole mess in the first place. I don't think that the book is necessarily THE Necronomicon, or if it is, it certainly isn't treated with the gravitas that such a tome demands, so I'm content to treat it as a reference. Nevertheless, you can see the threads that are tying this particular story together. It's one that leans heavily into the esoteric and conspiratorial, which immediately creates a heavy air of mystery as you attempt to uncover the secrets of the island and its inhabitants. You could chalk this all up to a studio sticking with what they know, but actually, The Council is Big Bad Wolf's first release. The company was only formed in 2015 as a branch or subsidiary of Cyanide, which is why the latter's logo is all over the game's splash screen. Despite being Big Bad Wolf's only credit, however, they are in charge of the upcoming Vampire the Masquerade Swan Song, which looks to be an adventure game in the same style as the Council. That's why it was really important for me to take a look at this game. And considering how much crossover there is between the setting and themes of the Council and Vampire the Masquerade, it seems like it would actually be a very fitting approach to the latter. The reason I bring this up is because of the Council's gameplay, specifically to the fact that it has some particularly strong RPG elements within. In fact, those RPG elements are a major selling point for the game. The Council's Steam page even goes so far as to mention hard-hitting decisions, permanent, long-lasting consequences, and a diverse skill set that promises to allow you to approach problems in a number of different ways. As far as how those promises actually play out, well, I do think that the Council successfully realizes these goals to a large degree. The Council is a game where choices and character growth does matter, and it does have a tangible effect on your progression. Like any decent RPG, you begin with character creation. Well, not so much creation, but customization. You will always play as Louis de Richet, the investigator. 
unlike Shepard the Spectre, whose cosmetics you can customize and whose personality you can augment through the use of dialogue choices and actual role-playing, Louis is what he is. However, the game does frame your character class as the sort of career that you specialize in. These classes, Diplomat, Occultist, and Detective, offer a basic starting package of skills which reflect their respective specialties by lumping in all their associated skills into a particular skill group. While you're free to spend your experience points on whatever skills you want, the skills outside of your class skills will always be more expensive to buy and upgrade. The actual skill system is fairly open and it lets you fine tune your character how you see fit, which honestly I wasn't exactly expecting. I assumed that the council would be far more limited in its ability to mix and match skills, but I was pleasantly surprised at how much freedom it gives you to develop your skill set, even outside of your class skills. Of course, heavily doing so isn't recommended as there are incentives that push you to develop your closely linked skills, but the possibility exists and that's the important part. Your skills can also be enhanced by reading manuscripts that you find on the island. You do this by equipping one during the beginning of a new chapter, after which you gain a permanent skill point associated with the subject matter of said book. Do this enough and you'll eventually be able to equip up to three books at a time. These books are all scattered throughout the game, and some of which are even broken up into parts that can only be read after you find all the components. But these books do tend to give you more than just a single point as a result. As they are, they're a really good early to mid game system that rounds out your skill points and gives you boosts in places that you might need them without spending any additional experience points. These skills are also augmented by traits, which themselves are rewards for accomplishing certain goals or making certain decisions over the course of the game. The opening scene drops one of these on your lap immediately, giving you the option to either trust your mother or act on your own. Doing the former unlocks the trusting trait, which gives you a permanent skill point in psychology. However, acting against her gives you the scarred trait, which not only gives you a permanent skill point in conviction, but it marks you with a scar across your nose as a consequence of your actions for the rest of the game. Traits can be positive or negative, but they almost always modify your skills one way or another, either in the form of giving you an extra skill point, or costing extra effort points to use. Each trait even has a little description of the events that tells you how you got that trait, so if you're ever wondering why the game is rewarding or punishing you, you know exactly why. On top of that, you can also unlock a number of talents, which differ from traits in that talents are permanent bonuses that are unlocked by performing certain actions or by unlocking the correct combination of skills. Unlike traits, whose requisites are hidden, you can see exactly what talents are available and immediately start working towards unlocking them. For example, putting two points into questioning and psychology and three points into vigilance will unlock the policing mastery talent, which halves the fake elements displayed during an opportunity. I should probably talk about opportunities. Opportunities are spontaneous events that pop up from time to time that give you a chance to uncover secrets not normally accessible through conversation. The screen will freeze and you'll have a few white dots pop up on it. Some of these are fake. They're red herrings trying to divert you away from the real clue. That's why that policing mastery comes into effect. It reduces the amount of fake dots that you see so you can narrow in on the correct one. Choosing the correct one, discerned by contextual clues from the preceding conversation, gives you a little bit more insight into the person you're dealing with. Some of these opportunities are locked behind skills, which means that if you don't have the required skill, you won't have a chance to get those extra bits of information that actually makes a bit of difference during some dialogues. The biggest downside with opportunities is that they're very binary. Unlike skills, for which multiple ones work during different conversations and it's open to experimentation, opportunities lack any sort of flexibility. You either pick the correct one or you don't, which calls into question their staying power on multiple playthroughs. However, they're not so common and overall they play a very minor role that doesn't really change the plot in terms of story development or plot progression. They're an added system that, while a little bit shallow, I think works just fine in the context of the game. On the other hand, the inclusion of those talents offers a little bit more depth when it comes to character building. They're an easy way to flesh out your character and open more doors for skill use by providing a tangible effect that you immediately benefit from, or benefit from in situations that aren't too uncommon. By encouraging the player to chase them, they complement the skill system by incentivizing you to spend your points and get abilities that will, in turn, have a small effect on how you approach any future situations. They feel rewarding when they're unlocked and they're a good inclusion to have. Skill use itself is pretty straightforward. Anytime Louis needs to use a skill to accomplish a task, you'll see an icon for the skill in question, along with your current level and a difficulty number. The difficulty number tells you how many effort points need to be expended to successfully use the skill, which you can see in the lower left corner of the screen. 
Effort points are basically an expendable currency that determine whether or not you can actually do an action. As you may expect, more difficult tasks require you to spend more effort points. But this is where the skill level comes in. You see, the higher your level in a particular skill, the lower the cost of the action is in effort points. If your skill level is high enough and the difficulty of the task is low enough, then using skills costs no effort points whatsoever. You can recover any expended effort points by using a consumable called Royal Jelly, which restores two points. There are a few other consumables that exist as well. Golden Elixir removes any negative status ailments. Devil's Thorn displays the vulnerabilities and immunities of a character you're talking to. And Carmelite Water gives you the focused status effect, which makes your next skill use free so long as you already have at least one level in it. The skills in the game are varied and diverse, and while they all function similarly during dialogue segments, they offer different avenues to acquire different clues during your investigation. I didn't feel like any one skill was really ignored. Anytime I lacked the skill to do a certain action, I found other opportunities to use the skills that I did have in abundance. Not only that, but between leveling up between chapters, talents, traits, and equipping manuscripts, I found that the rate of progression was very well balanced. It may seem like the game is giving skill points away like candy, but keep in mind that ranking up a skill from one level to the next takes a large amount of skill points to be invested, starting off with 5 points to go from 0 to 1. You may be very skilled by the game's end, but you won't have maxed out everything, and there still will be a few gaps in what you're able to do, which means that effort point management remains just as important by the end of the game as it was in the beginning. Easier in some cases is yes, but not suddenly irrelevant. The difficulty curve remains consistent, which I think is pretty vital when it comes to anything that's using a skill-based system. Otherwise, accomplishing tasks becomes rote and you lose any sense of satisfaction that you get for overcoming certain difficulties. These systems are wonderful since they give skill use a strategic aspect to it. It makes you wonder if it's really worth it to expend those effort points on a particular task or a piece of information, or if you'd rather save them for something more important later in the chapter. Alternatively, it also makes you question whether or not it's worthwhile to use some of your consumables since they're not exactly readily available, and Louis can only hold a maximum of five of each. It's not like the island you're on is teeming with royal jelly merchants or anything. Sometimes, you'll have the option of a number of different skills to accomplish the same or similar ends, which makes that choice relatively easy. Just go with the one that costs you the fewest amount of effort points and lean into your character class. However, not all outcomes are equal, and choosing some skills will give you outcomes you might not desire. Of course, all of this is further complicated by the social influence system, which basically takes into account the various psychological profiles and personalities of the game's characters, which allows you to exploit their weaknesses. Using a skill that a character that you're confronting is immune to will give you a negative status condition, but on the other hand, exploiting one of their weaknesses will make it easier to elicit information out of them, or if you're facing them in a social confrontation, you can successfully progress to the next stage. These confrontations are a hallmark of the Council's game systems. They're a step further than basic conversations where you can use your standard skill checks. Rather, they function as a sort of social combat system. What you're aiming to do is manipulate the other person to gain the upper hand against them in order to get your desired outcome, whether it's getting extra information or convincing them that your outlook is the right one, or maybe even getting out of danger. As you may expect, your knowledge of the other character's psychological vulnerabilities and immunities makes this easier, but so does any other bits of information that you may discover about them while you're investigating, as these may open up new dialogue options for you to use. However, this can be a little bit too easily exploited, I think. Once you discover the quirks of someone's psychological profile, it's forever recorded on the summary of that particular character on the start menu. And there's nothing stopping you from opening the menu mid-conversation to look up the character profile, which eliminates some of the tension from these situations. Of course, even with this feature, if you don't have the correct skills or background information to open up certain dialogue choices, you can still lose a confrontation by making too many blunders while engaging in one, which is done by choosing the wrong dialogue choice or by using a skill associated with that particular character's immunity, which is an automatic failure regardless of circumstances. Of course, the cool thing about the council is that failing a confrontation isn't a dramatic game ender. It just means that you don't get the outcome that you necessarily wanted. These confrontations can have a fairly significant impact on the plot's progression and development, since they can entirely change the scope of the story by going so far as eliminating characters or entire situations. At least, on the surface of things. You have a single save file that auto-updates as you play, and you cannot revert back to a previous checkpoint. Ever. 
Safe scumming has been effectively eliminated in order to make you feel the weight of your actions, and as a result, the outcomes of everything you do has a permanency to it, which really helps strengthen the narrative by making every decision you make feel impactful. Things like permanent disfigurement or temporary status conditions that cost you more effort points to use your particular skills means that your approach to how you play the game and how you use your skills can be affected by your gameplay decisions. And the reactivity of the game could very well throw you off balance and force you to change your approach as the chapter advances. This integration goes so deep as to actually even disallow the player to skip lines of dialogue on the first time going through the game in an effort to really make them focus on what's being said. On the surface of it, this seems like it would be extremely annoying, but when you consider that you can't actually reload old saves at all, it sort of makes sense given as to how important the dialogue is to the way that the council is played. However, this only ever refers to a first-time playthrough. If you beat the game or complete a chapter and reload it from within your save file, you can very easily skip all the dialogue to your heart's content. The resulting relationship between the gameplay mechanics and the game's narrative is one of perfect complementation. Each one works in tandem in order to drive home a story about social manipulations and occult investigations that places you squarely in the world that sufficiently reacts to your gameplay choices. About as well as a video game can, that is, while still offering you a deeply compelling series of mysteries that keeps you on the edge of your seat to see what happens next. Or at least, it did until the game's final chapters. As much as the Council's gameplay and story are so well woven together that it feels as if one is a natural extension of the other, a discussion of the game's plot deserves special attention. Not the least which a bit because it's the main selling point of the game, being an adventure RPG hybrid and all, but also because of how sharply it makes a turn for the absurd during its climax. Now, I'm not going to talk about the main story itself, and I'm going out of my way to avoid any spoilers in this video. The only thing I'm going to mention is that I think that the story takes a massive nosedive in terms of quality by the time you reach the ending. What was once a series of carefully crafted dialogues chocked full of intrigue and mystery gets swept aside in the worst possible way, losing all of its grounding in the process. If you've been watching my channel for long enough, you can get a sense of the stuff that I'm into, and while it seems like the game's finale sounds great on paper, it's just shoehorned in so sloppily that I would not be surprised if it soured the entire experience for many players. And I'm not talking about just the game's ending either, of which there are several variants. And as you may expect, these variations depend on the decisions you've made in previous chapters, going so far back as taking into account which other characters you have chosen to trust or not in some cases. The council even includes ending slides to show you the fate of everybody you met over the course of your adventure. No, the issue isn't the ending per se, but the entire build-up to it. The game's conclusion, that is, about the midway point of the game's fourth chapter and the entirety of the fifth and final one, creates a stark contrast with the previous three in terms of the options that you're presented with and their respective outcomes. You still have plenty of different skill checks to make, but there is less reactivity to them. And while there are still some major choices to be made, the outcomes of which do depend on certain circumstances from previous chapters, they aren't nearly as numerous. Previous areas were much more open-ended. Well, if you discount the servants that block off access to the other areas of the mansion in an effort to keep you on course, whereas the final chapters devolve into hallways that force you to follow your objective markers. The difference between the two is that in the first half, there was still room for exploration, even if you were sealed off to a particular wing of the mansion because at least the areas were big enough for you to poke around in. The latter portion does away with this almost entirely. This is exemplified very clearly even by looking at the recaps of every chapter, which highlights not only the things that you succeeded or failed at, but also alternate paths that you were able to take, which is strangely, or perhaps not so strangely, very empty in the game's later chapters. While I can understand this when taking into consideration the historical themes in play, it does leave you with a sense of being railroaded that undermines the freedoms that are not only promised, but the game otherwise does a pretty good job of honoring. For example, there's one section of the game where you can lay down the groundwork for a tentative peace between Napoleon Bonaparte and Manuel Godoy and prevent the War of the Pyrenees from even starting. But, even if you succeed in this endeavor, your efforts are for naught since the game will ignore this and have the characters go to war anyway. Yes, it's a historical event, and if you prevent it in-game, it creates a sort of time paradox that makes everything else all screwed up, or creates an alternate timeline where Vulcan is blown up and we're subjected to three more horrible Star Wars movies, but from a gaming perspective, it feels really, really cheap. 
There's also one very major plot development that I also won't go into because, again, I don't want to spoil it, but I was very disappointed with the reactions that it garnered. It wasn't completely ignored, but it was a major moment and to only have it brought up quickly and then brushed aside hurts the immersion when it comes to this particular instance of reactivity. Presumably it was done to minimize the time programming entire strings of dialogue and recalibrating the final scenarios, and that's understandable, but for a game that prides itself on the Choices Matter moniker, I do wish it had a little bit more fanfare. In conjunction with the narrowing of your ability to steer the plot, it leaves a really bad taste in the mouth as this once very promising, very compelling game reverses course and seemingly opts for the cheap surprises rather than any sort of deeper payoffs. There's a supernatural element here, and I don't actually dislike that it's there, but it comes out of nowhere and is played so heavy-handedly that it felt as if it undermined all of the carefully planned mysteries leading up to that point. Now, with all that being said, I think that the rest of the game is written well enough that it alone is worth playing through. I really do. The first three chapters do a splendid job of creating an era of historical mystery steeped in very era-appropriate themes, such as secret societies and occultism that I found gripping. As you progress, you'll quickly have a sense that not everything is as it seems. Trust is in short supply, and some truths will be worth more to you than gold. It's very easy to get lost in, especially when taking into account its visuals, which are fairly good. Facial animations look fluid and mostly natural, and characters are easily able to show emotions that further accentuate their body language. It does well to enhance the game's dialogue and give it a deeper sense of immersion. Moreover, the game makes excellent use of historical art pieces and books to create a world vividly reflecting the era in which it's set, which does well to further make the setting feel more alive. Lighting, while not dynamic, does a good job of making interiors feel antique, with things like static candles glowing off in the corners of your screen, which, alongside the use of shading in certain areas, does give it the illusion of being an 18th century manor that you're wandering through, with dim interiors and dingy hallways. This holds up for the most part. There are some narrative bits that do break that level of immersion for me, but only because of modern sensibilities. For instance, I find it a bit strange that people in the 18th century don't react negatively to or are even slightly off-put by the image of a woman whose body is covered in tattoos. While this is likely an oversight, it does reinforce that this is a work of fiction. Well, probably. All this is tied together by the game's dialogue and writing, which is pretty good. While the writing can be on the nose at times and lay on the references to events a little bit thickly, it does so only to contextualize certain things that somebody who is unfamiliar with the setting may not latch onto. And that's fine, but it doesn't feel very well integrated all the time. If the exposition was better embedded into the dialogue, it would only strengthen the script that much more. Fortunately, these instances don't dominate the script, and for the most part, the conversations play out fairly naturally, even going so far as to include asides as you see what Louis's thoughts about certain situations are. And this is driven home by some fairly good voice acting. Some transitions and deliveries are awkward, and definitely feel as if they're straining the actor's abilities. You think you're investigator of the year? Have you taken a look at yourself, Dorice? Didn't you get enough beating her black and blue the last time? I did not! But for the most part, it works very well in line with the game's script. Louis was probably the most expressive out of the bunch, with his tone shifting depending on the skills selected during conversations, but this is also probably a bias since he's the voice that you obviously hear the most of over the course of the game. I don't think that there was any particular character that stood out to me as badly executed, Peru coming the closest, but given the size of the game and its budget, the presentation is satisfactory. And ultimately, that summarizes my thoughts about the Council as a whole. It's satisfactory. I don't quite think it's ever going to be a classic, but it does enough things well that it could very well act as a template for future adventure games to follow suit. I think that its gameplay systems and central playing experience is excellent, but it's very much let down by the extremely weak finale and fewer and fewer adaptive scenarios by the time you reach it. As much as the game's main narrative may jump the shark, the ocean the shark is in, and crash land onto the moon after somersaulting through space, the process of unraveling its mystery is still very much worthwhile, and the game has lots to offer, even on subsequent playthroughs. I think that if you're interested in an adventure game that is more than just a mere adventure game, if that makes sense, it might very well be worth looking into, especially if you're driven by mystery plots steeped in the occult and fairly strong dialogue-driven gameplay. So, suffice it to say, I'm fairly positive on the Council, and I have no problems recommending it, albeit with the warnings that I've outlined in this review. As for myself, 
The Council will be one of those games I'll dust off in the future and play again sometime down the line, once its details have faded from my memory enough to make me appreciate the experience once more. Sort of like a bottle of wine with a very disappointing finish and an acrid aftertaste that you probably need a chaser for.